Welcome to Hot Chips 29. Session 4. Processors. Well, welcome back as you all continue to come in to the final session of the day. This is a, a group of diverse papers all under the title of Processors. And you're going to hear a number of very exciting presentations covering a variety of uh, different uh, processors representing different, uh, different workloads, different target uh, markets. Uh, I'm Stuart Oberman from NVIDIA, and I'll be the chair for this session. You're going to hear from talks uh, from small company, large, academic, and industry. So it's going to be a, a very exciting processor session. So our first talk is going to be given by Jian Uyang. Uh, Jian is the principal architect of Baidu. He's responsible for the heterogeneous computing system of data center, cloud, and autonomous driving. Uh, he's no stranger to publishing. He's published at Asplos, and he's been here at Hot Chips uh, in 2014 and 2015. The title of his talk is XPU, a Programmable FPG Accelerator for Diverse Workloads. John. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jian, the principal architect of Baidu. Today, my presentation is the XPU, the, a Programmable FPG Accelerator for Diverse Workload. This work is collaborative with uh, FM Wu, who is from Silence. This is the outline. Firstly, I will give the background of the FPGA for emergent application. We found the potential of FPGA for AI and big data, and I will give the overview of FPGA accelerator in a real system. And then I will show the challenge of using FPGA for diverse workload. And we propose the SPU including the motivation, architecture, program model, implementation, and the evaluation. And at last is the conclusion. Uh, we found the potential of IPJ for the AI and the big data. The AI and big data application can be appreciated to several basic kernels. For example, the AI application includes the convolution, matrix multiplication, activation, and other element-wise kernels. And the data analyst includes the compilation, decompilation, filter, sort, dry, and aggregation. To support this kernel, we need a new architecture. For example, for the computing, we need a massive Mac array for the math function. And we also need a high bandwidth off-chain memory, and the high bandwidth and low latency on-chain memory. We also need a high bandwidth I.O. Fortunately, the FPGA can meet all the requirements of this new architecture. For the computing, the FPGA has thousands of DSP, millions of lookup tables, and very strong data path. And FPGA also have the op-chip DDR4 and HBM interface. FPGA has the tens of megabyte on-chip SLAM, and FPGA also has the PCIe and SOTIS interface. So we can conclude that the IPJ had the potential for the AI and big data. So we have made great effort on using IPJ in the real system. We have published two papers on how chips. The first is the Soviet Defined Accelerator uh, for the deep learning on how chip 2014. And the next is the Soviet Defined Accelerator for the data analyst on how chip 2016. The two papers demonstrate the feasibility of using FPJ in the real system. Beyond the paper, we had deployed FPJ, deployed thousands of FPJ in our real system. In the data center, we had, uh, we had deployed FPJ for our speech recognition, image, 
and search engine in the past several years. We also had deployed the FPJ in our cloud, uh, very similar like the AWS F1. And on the edge side, we also using FPJ to accelerate the algorithm for the autonomous driving. So both the edge and the data center, the FPJ can work very well. Even the FPJ can work very well in the data center and the edge, but we found the, there are some limit, limitation for the FPJ uh, of FPJ for wider scenarios. We found the major challenge is that the FPJ cannot work well for the diverse workload. But most applications contain diverse workload. I will take the autonomous driving as an example. The image from the camera will be pre-processed firstly, and then the image will go to the convolution networking for the processing. And the result of the processing will output to the planning and control module. The planning and control module has lots of the plan loop based kernels. So the diverse workloads often includes the computing intensive kernels, memory bulk kernels, and the loop based kernels. They often have the several very big kernels, such as the convolution and mesh multiplication, and also includes lots of small kernels, for example, uh, the activation element wise and some uh, computer vision kernel. In theory, FPGA had the potential to support all kinds of the workload because FPGA is very low latency and predictable latency. FPGA also had a massive parallelism computer unit and FPGA had high memory bandwidth. But actually, FPJ is not good at support the diverse workload because FPJ is the hardware reconfigurable. It uses the dedicated logic for the specific function. It lacks the flexible program mobility. So to solve the, the disadvantage of FPJ, we propose the SPU. We hope the SPU can leverage some advantage of the CPU, FPJ, and the GPU. The traditional FPJ accelerator aims at the specific workload. It's a high efficiency, but lacks of programmability. The traditional CPU aims at the general purpose workloads, especially the loop based workloads. It's a very high flexibility. And the GPU aims at the parallelism workloads. It's a very high performance. We hold the SPU. A at the diverse workload includes the computing intensive workload and the loop based workload. And we hold the SPU is very high efficiency, flexible, and very high performance. There are three design goals for the SPU. The first is the high efficiency. We key the customized load circle for the specific workload to achieve the high efficiency. This is very similar to the software defined accelerator as I present. And the second is the high flexibility. Um, we propose the ISA-based core. This core is a software programmable, and this core is customized for the loop-based kernel. To achieve the high performance, we implement many core for the parallelism workloads. Uh, this is the high-level building block of the SPU. There are three parts. The first part is the many tiny core. It is the instruction set based software programmable. And the core is very slight. There's no OS support, no catch. And uh, the ISA is domain specific. It's very flexible to, so, to serve the diverse workload. And the second part is the customized logic. It's very similar to the SDA. And it's hardware configurable. The customized logic achieves the high performance efficiency. And uh, the third part is the data path to serve the DDR channel and the uh, DMA. And the ratio of course and uh, customer logic can be configurable depending on the application requirement. This is the architecture of the tiny core. 32 cores are clustering for the data locality and the synchronization. And 
from the implementation perspective, the core clustering is helpful for the routing and placement. And each core clustering has one shared memory for the data synchronization. The size of shared memory is 32 kilobyte, and each core clustering has one uh, special, special function accelerator. This accelerator is for the nonlinear non math function. And this is the pipeline of the, the core. The instruction set is similar to the MIPS. Each core has the private scratch pad memory. The size is 30, 16 kilobyte or the 32 kilobyte. As I mentioned before, the core is customized for the loop based kernel. And the, and the FPGA frequency is very low, so we sort the pipeline. The pipeline is only four stages. It can achieve a very low latency. And we're using the DHT to reduce the overhead of the branch miss. Uh, this is the program model. As we know, the SPU is implemented uh, on the FPGA car. It's a, it's a PCIe attached car. So the program model is similar to the traditional PCIe car, uh, such as GPU or FPGA. And the customized logic provides the inform informative commands. And the time core is similar to the traditional CPU. We write the assembler code for the tiny core. Today, there is no the compiler for the tiny core. In the future, we will uh, design its own compiler. And the left figure is the design flow. Uh, the, step, the first step is to partition the workload into the customer logic or into the tiny core. And the step two is write the tiny core code and write the code for the customer logic. And step three is compile all the code into one binary and run at the US system, uh, uh, OS. Uh, we implement the SPU on the FPGA. You can see the, the tiny core is very, uh, very uh, simple. And one core only consumes about 1,200 lookup table and fully floss, 4 DSP, and 5 block lamp. And we also implement the many tiny core. The resource scale linear as the core number. We implement 256 core. It consumes 25% uh, of the lookup table and 15% DSP on VU9P. We also implement the customer, customized logic as the core as, as DA version 2. It consumes 5,000 DSP block. The next several slides is about uh, the evaluation. This is the setup. The host is 2 Eon, Eon 5 processor with 128 gigabyte memory. And the host is the Linux system. And we implement the SPU on U9P. There are 256 tiny cores running at 600 megahertz. And the customized logic is the SDA2 for deep learning, 16-bit fixed point, 600 megahertz, and up to 6.1 TED ops. And the host interface is the PCIe Gen 3 by 16. And there are four DDR4 channels. We pick up five different kernels to evaluate the SPU. Uh, the case one is a very simple micro benchmark kernel. And case two is the computing intensive kernel. Case three is the regular memory access kernel. Case four is the random memory access kernel. And the final case is the loop based kernel. Let me see the case one. Case one is the very simple. It's one to 100 accumulation. We, uh, the CPU code is optimized by the GCC O2 configuration. And it consumes about 310 cycle, CPU cycle. The SPU core consumes uh, 300 cycles. Even though the SPU cycle is lower than the CPU, but we can conclude that the SPU had the same pipeline efficiency as the CPU. And the uh, case two is the softmax kernel from the CAFE pedal, CAFE framework. Uh, this is the detailed configuration. 
and the CPU single core is about 20.4 milliseconds, and the SPU single core is about uh, 20.5 milliseconds. We can see that for the in computing intensive kernel, the SPU had the same performance as the CPU. And the case three is the slice kernel from the cafe framework. Uh, this is the, the detailed uh, configuration. The SPU core, uh, the CPU core can, is about uh, 3.7 million seconds, and the SPU is about 1.7 million seconds. For the regular memory assets kernel, the SPU have better performance than the CPU. And this is the case four. Uh, this is a kernel from computer vision. Uh, this is a real workload from, yes. And there are 100 kilo pixel input. Each pixel, each pixel have X, Y, Z, and pi elements. The live figure is the pseudo code for each pixel. We calculate the index by the x and y, and update other four matrices by the index. This is a random memory access intensive kernel. The CPU core is about 6, 18 milliseconds, and the SPU core uh, is slower. It's about 720 milliseconds. Uh, the major reason is that the SPU is the, in the early stage and the memory controller is not optimized for the random memory access. And the final case is uh, the loop-based kernel. Uh, the live figure is the pseudocode. You can see there are lots of the if-else statement. The CPU core is about five kilo cycles, and the SPU single core is about 4.4 kilo cycles. Even though the SPU frequency is lower than the CPU bar, we can see the SPU had a similar pipeline efficiency as the CPU. As I mentioned before, the SPU core is optimized for the loop-based kernel, so you can, see, you, can, you can see this case. And we also evaluate the scalability of the SPU for the softmap kernel. A core SPU can achieve uh, 5.8 times than the one core. And for the slice kernel, four cores achieve 2.2 times than one core. You can see that the scalability is not linear as the core number uh, because, the, because there are some data synchronization. And the SPU is in the early stage. In the future, we will optimize the data synchronization between the core. And for the case five, this is, this, uh, this is the task level parallelism without synchronization amongst the task. And 215 six core can achieve about uh, 16 four times faster than the CPU and about 25 times power efficiency than the CPU. So we can see if there is no data synchronization between the core, the performance will scale out linearly. And this is the final conclusion. Yes, as, as I mentioned before, we have using IPJ for many years in, in Baidu. We have deployed uh, thousands of IPJ in our data center and our cloud and our autonomous driving. We know the advantage of IPJ. We know the application algorithm. And we also know the disadvantage of IPJ. And we know how to improve the, the, the IPJ. We found the traditional IPJ accelerator is only for the specific workload. Yeah. And, but the diverse workloads are very common for the data center, cloud, and autonomous driving. Even for the deep learning, beyond the matrix multiplication and the convolution, there are lots of small kernels. So we propose the SPU. The SPU can work very well for the diverse workload and both very well for the bigger kernel. The SPU provides software programmable by instruction set based architecture. And it also guarantees the high efficiency by the customized logic. Uh, we had 
we have deployed the SPU in our real system, for example, in the data center and the autonomous driving. Uh, we demonstrate, uh, as the evaluation part, we demonstrate the performance and, and the efficiency. Yeah, and we prove that the SPU work very well for the diverse workload. Thank you very much. So we have some time for a few questions. If we can go to either podium and just uh, announce name and affiliation, please. Shigel on Cavium. Um, so you have 256 scores, and when you do need to synchronize between them, what mechanism do you provide for synchronization? Because synchronization does not really scale linearly with the number of scores. Sorry. Can you repeat? Gotcha. Okay. Could you repeat the question just to make sure he ha understands it? What mechanisms are provided for synchronization since synchronization does not scale linearly with the number of cores, providing 256 cores, large number of cores, how do you synchronize them when you need to? Synchronization methods? Synchronization. Uh, you mean the, the uh, 215 six core case? Sorry, I'm, yeah, can you repeat? Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we're using the same memory and using the synchronization instruction for the data synchronization. And for, for, the, for, case, uh, for case five, there's no synchronization between ta each task. Uh, okay, maybe I'll pull up later. Okay, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Michael Shea, the question here is, uh, did you have any uh, un, uh, analysis done on uh, this type of approach uh, being customized uh, as an ASIC? So what kind of uh, performance uh, would you be predicting for a ASIC version of this type of chip? Uh, yeah, today there's no ASIC. Uh, yeah, uh, I understand. It's your FPGA. Sorry. Do you want to back? Yeah, because there's no ASIC for this application, so if we, if we uh, implement the, the ASIC, maybe the frequency will be higher and the performance will be better. Ah, okay. So there is some headroom there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, can you introduce more about how to program your XPU? Uh, for example, you mentioned you have a simple instruction set, so need I to reconfigure the FPJ to support case one, two, three, or five? That's the first uh, question. And the second question is about, you mentioned the uh, tiny core is running at 600 megahertz. So uh, what's the frequency of the whole system? Uh, can we still run 600 megahertz uh, of the whole system? Thank you. Uh, for the question one, we write the code uh, by the assembler today. There's no compiler. Uh, so, uh, and, and the question two, uh, the core is running on the 600 megahertz, but the memory part running uh, on lower rate frequency. Okay, thank you. Hey, I, Andrew Pettit, Microsoft. Um, as kind of a clarifying question based on that, do you have a single clock frequency at 600 megahertz for all the logic and the DSPs? Or is that just the DSP core that's running at 600 megahertz? Uh, sorry? Is it only the DSP core at 600 megahertz, or is the whole the whole, core, the whole core, all the whole 256 core. places yeah, yeah, yeah. cores are the whole 600? Core. We'll be using the P-block uh, technology to, to key the core physically. So the frequency can run on 600 megahertz. Okay, so what's the magic? The micro blaze for the same generation on the ver fastest Vertex 7 Ultra Scale Plus mm -hmm. is running at 491. So what's the secret to getting up to 600? Yeah, this is on VU9P, and that's two uh, device. Hi, this is A. Samuel from uh, uh, Samsung. Uh, 
First question, do you have uh, caches internal to the tiny cores uh, uh, instruction or data? Second question is, uh, for loop intensive uh, applications, how do you compare this model versus a GPU SIMT model in terms of efficiency? Uh, so what is the question one? Uh, the first one is, do you have caches in the tiny core? No cache, uh, only the scarlet path memory. Okay, the second one is, for loop intensive applications, how do you compare the tiny cores compared to uh, you know, a GPU vector uh, CINT model yeah, uh, in terms of efficiency? In the evaluation part, the case one and the case five is the loop intensive kernel. Yeah, we, 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 the core is optimized uh, for the loop based kernel. We, we're using the BHT to reduce the, the branch miss. Did you compare the, the performance versus a GPU? No GPU, it's a CPU. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, John Davis, Big Stream. Do you guys have any plans on uh, making that core open source? Uh, sorry? Open, open source. Open source. Uh, <laughs> not that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, if that's it, let's thank the speaker. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we've talked about Baidu. We've looked at uh, programmable cores from that perspective. This brings us to uh, a another company that we have, are, are should be all very familiar with, Intel, and to hear what they have to say with their one of their new processors. And the speaker of today is going to be uh, Jesus Corbal. Uh, Jesus is a principal engineer at Intel and one of the primary architects of the Knight's Landing processor, as well as the lead architect for Knight's Mill. His research, research interests include vector microarchitectures, and he was a part of the development team that created the AVX 512 ISA extensions. Jesus received a PhD in computer engineering from the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, and the title of his talk is Knight's Mill, New Intel Processor for Machine Learning. Is it working? Yeah, seems so. Okay. So, first of all, sorry for a slide so generic and everybody knows, but maybe let me try to clarify a little bit about the title, because it seems a little bit like a misnomer. Yes, Night Mill, it's a new Intel chip, and yes, it's for machine learning, but that's so very generic, right? Because machine learning, it's just a wide umbrella of different type of algorithms that they have been using for many, many years by all the main uh, data center companies. Algorithms like random forest, decision trees, graph analytics that are basically typically focused on, based on training data and a lot of high amount of human interaction because we need to put the smarts into the, the way we are doing the inference we're able to make uh, informed decisions, right? The, and this is the type of algorithms that we have seen in the past, like, for instance, when Google is able to detect a mail as a spam, or Amazon is able to recommend us new products based on something that we shouldn't have bought because it's very expensive, or maybe Netflix recommends us new movies based on what we have already seen. But what we, it has been a revolution during the last recent years is deep learning, right? Which is just, at the end of the day, a fancy name for, for neural networks. Those same neural networks that we studied at college, that were around from the 60s, from the 70s, which are basically this concept of uh, laying around a set of perceptrons, which are basically glorified linear equations with a little bit of a sigmoid function at the very end, into a, a specific topology with different uh, widths and different depths. And the key thing about neural networks is that basically they are able to learn by themselves. Right? The models are trained autonomously. Basically, if we have a lot, lots and lots of highly curated data, um, we have the outcomes for that, we can basically train it, and that's the blessing and the cures of, of deep learning, right? That basically we don't know how. But what it's, no matter what, what we have seen is impressive breakthroughs in speech learning and image recognition, uh, thanks to deep learning. And the solutions that you can use to solve this problem of deep learning basically depend on how you want to address the problem, right? And this, this slide comes from marketing, but I, I love it, right? What you can see basically here is that 
you can decide how you want to address a, uh, a particular deep learning training problem, like basically l teaching a, deep, a neural network how to actually address a specific set of data by going into in, in one way or the other in a single dimension, which is how much I want to accelerate. It's basically all about general purpose or acceleration, being narrow, but being able to have the highest performing, or being able to address any particular problem. If you want to go on the left, if you want to go for all purpose, well, of course, this is an Intel marketing slide. We are <laughs> pitching the idea of using our Xeon processors. Basically, it's all about being able to use hyperscale, right? You, ha you are a big company with a huge data center. You are already investing in, in general purpose servers. You might as well use the exceeded computing bandwidth in order to address the problem of deep learning training, even if you don't have the highest performance per node. On the other hand, if you really care about the time to training, basically you want to, no matter at what cost, you want to get the highest performance and reducing the time to, to being able to train, then you go for accelerators. At Intel, we are pitching the idea of using FPGAs from, from Altera if you care about inference, because FPGAs are very nice from the point of view of latency, which is even more important for inference than throughput. They are very low power and they, they are highly versatile. If you want to go for training, then we are proposing to use the Crest family, which is basically uh, powered by Nirvana technology. So if I'm saying this, right, you may go for hyperscale or you may go for pure acceleration. Why I'm talking today about using Xeon 5 for deep learning, which was traditionally a supercomputing product. Well, Xeon 5 strives to be a solution in the middle. We want to provide very compelling per node performance, very close to accelerations. Of course, it will never be able to match an accelerator because it's still a general purpose processor. And at the same time, we want to have the scale out capabilities of a regular mainstream Xeon processor. Of course, with KBS, we won't be able to be as fast for all the applications in the world, but we can be fast enough for, for the applications that we care. And for the highly strategic ones, then we are very close to accelerator. And this is how we are introducing today Knight's Mill. It's our first, basically, you know that Xeon 5 was typically traditionally a supercomputing product. We are basically building on top of the second generation of Intel Xeon 5 processor, basically Knight's landing machine. We are creating a new proliferation that tries to specifically address the problem of deep learning. And for that, and I'm really sorry, but you will find the presentation to be a little bit lacking from the point of view of uh, SOC details, and there won't be any performance projection whatsoever. Really sorry for that. Unfortunately, it was a problem of really bad timing. Uh, we are going to release this product in Q4 of this year, and I think product marketing is going to do the final rollout in, in the next months or two. So I'm just a lowly architect, so I couldn't. I will try to compensate that with, uh, by giving more details on the underlying microarchitecture and how we are trying to give hints on how we are actually able to, to provide this 4x deep learning performance peak over night's landing in such a, a short amount of time. So this is the, this idea of basically able to do scale out, <coughs> a scale out on deep learning with Xeon 5. It's all about integration of all different components. It's all about first being able to have a very performing machine, right? For that, we have a manicore design based on Knight's Landing that, as you will see today in this presentation, it's using a new form of instructions that try to exploit a new form of parallelism. But it's not all about the, the compute itself, right? It's all about the, 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 the full system. So we understand that another important thing is memory. But it's not only bandwidth, it's also capacity. So in our case, in this case, it's like we want the cake and eat it too. We have a hybrid memory system where basically we are able to combine together just mainstream regular DDR4 for high capacity because there are many deep learning models that they really require this capacity. We want as much uh, memory as possible. But at the same time, if we are impl implementing this high flop density, we need to feed the machine. And for that, that's why we have integrated package memory. In this case, in Night's Mill, it's a proliferation of Night's Landing. We are using MCDRAM. And the idea is that software needs to do a very, very um, a smart allocation of the data structures to know where we need the capacity and where we need the bandwidth. And finally, something very important is that this is not an accelerator. It's, a, it's an actual Xeon class machine that it's able to execute any Xeon binary from Broadwell and below. And it's basically a bootable CPU that it's able to, to connect directly to the, to the network. It's basically designed 
from the point of view of scaling out. So let's go back to this mysterious 4x performance. Who are we reaching there, right? And if you look at the presentation from, from Ida Sonadi two years ago from Night's Landing, you will be able to see that we were exploiting three different levels of parallelism. Nothing very new, right? We were expecting threat level parallelism because we have a money core architecture. Uh, co uh, basically, we have many small cores, quite capable for their size, connected with a very high performance 2D mesh. Then we're also exploiting this TLP, this threat level parallelism, via simultaneous multi threading for extra efficiency. Then, of course, we are exploiting instruction level parallelism. We have a quite capable two way superscalar auto further core based on, on an evolution of, of an atom processor. And, of course, that, that was the big feature of night landing. We are exploiting DLP with the new ABX512 vector extensions that basically extend the previous ones, ABX, from 512 bits of SIMD processing into 1024 bits of SIMD processing. So what we, you will see today in night's mill, it's a, a stuff in red. This is a new things that we are introducing in order to provide this for X, specifically for deep learning. The first one is that we are doubling down in DLP because simple processing is so very efficient. And for that, we are introducing this new data type, which is called VNNI. It's just a marketing name. I, I, you will see during the presentation that it's basically an evolution of instructions that we already had that were very useful for ADO in the past, but though they are especially tailored for, for deep learning training. And the most important one is that now we are doing a, a new form of parallelism. Let's call it pipeline level parallelism, which is basically this concept of chaining together instructions that depend one up, uh, upon the other. Basically, if we are able to extend these instructions into a very long pipeline and we are able to hide the latency, we're able to multiply the throughput. In a way, not dissimilar to the concept of an FMA. Right? An FMA is basically fusing together a, flo uh, a floating point multiply and a floating point add to basically multiply a throughput by two. So this is a very high level view of the Knights Mill SOC. I won't double down in, in the details. Basically, it's based on Knights Landing. It's a money core architecture. Uh, I won't be able to disclose the number of cores today, but basically what we have is a 2D mesh connecting to the, uh, a certain number of KNM tiles. Every one of these Knights, uh, Knights Mill tiles, it's basically an L2 catch that is able to fit together two different Knights Mill cores. And every one of these cores, we will see more details on the architecture of, of the core, has a VPU that is able to do the actual SIMD processing. Uh, it's very important to understand that basically we have integrated package memory in the form of MC RAM, and of course we can connect to mainstream DDR. Okay, this is a very, <coughs> it's a very busy slide, but in a way it's kind of like the, um, the magic sauce of, of Night's Mill. Uh, this was, these were already introduced uh, in the web some months ago. Basically, we call, we call these instructions Quad FMA. And in a way, even if they may look uh, complex in, in principle, it's basically this, uh, co it's this concept of taking together four FMA operations that depend one after the other. Basically, the result of one FMA fits into the accumulation of the next one, which many will, fi will find it a very familiar construct, right? It's called a dot product. But the idea is that here we're exploiting two different levels of parallelism. Traditional, traditionally, we will have a single FMA, right? A single FMA, SIMD FMA, it's basically a collection of different FMA entities, in this case, floating point 32, laid out horizontally because they work on independent pieces of data. We basically bring a catch line. There's no relationship whatsoever between the, all the different operations. We operate and we return it back. Of course, typically when you find, what you will find in a typical deep learning uh, kernel is that you have a dot product. In this dot product, basically you have a one FMA after the other where you are accumulating over the same result. Well, what if we extend the parallelism over this fusion depth, so to speak? This is the pipeline level parallelism that we are talking about. Are we able to build more FMA entities vertically so that one fits after the other? And of course, the trick here is that every time that we add an extra level of depth in this, we are adding more latency, right? If we have three cycles of FMA over here, and we add four of those, we are actually adding 12 cycles of latency. If we don't have enough ILP to hide that latency, the efficiency will go down, and you will end up with no performance whatsoever. 
Semantics about this instruction are really straightforward when you look at it. The idea is that you have a single vector destination that works as the accumulator, that will be ZMM4. Then you are able to specify these clusters of vector operands. Basically, or for instance, you can specify ZMM0 all the way to ZMM3, or ZMM4 all the way to ZMM7. It's just basically an encoding trick, so you can specify four different vector operands. And then one single memory operand, which in a way, it's, it's actually a collection of a scalar operands. The semantics of the instruction is you take this collection of four scalars from M128, you broadcast every one of those, and you multiply it by every one of the vector sources in the source block. You keep accumulating over ZMM4, and you end up with the final result. You probably see this slide and say, what is this? I don't understand. How can you actually use this? And the simple answer is that you can use these some matrix multiplications. And, and this was already commented in the, the excellent Volta presentation this morning. Like, in reality, even if it looks at a simplification, most of the neural network applications, if you relay out the data conveniently, it looks like a matrix multiplication. Of course, not all gems are the same, right? It all depends on the dimensions, so they have different properties from the point of view of parallelism. But let's look at an example of how we will do a matrix multiplication with QFMA in order to uh, start to understand a little bit how we are actually able to increase the performance. So imagine in this example that we are doing a multiplication of A into B, accumulating into C. Well, the idea is that you will typically do a dot product of this element 0, 1, 2, 3 into every, one, into every column, into every row of this column B, right? But of course, this is how you process it in the scalar mode. What you want to do is vectorize. How do you vectorize? Well, instead of just calculating this single element 0, 0, you calculate a whole row of C. So you broadcast 0 into all the elements of ZMM0. You broadcast 1 into all the elements of ZMM1. You broadcast element 2 into ZMM2. And you keep accumulating until you end up with no rows in B. Well, what if we pack together four of these guys, which happen to be consecutively aligned in memory, and we specify these four sources, which are basically the rows that we just fetched from B? Well, you end up with the basic concept of a QFMA. Of course, remember that I told you that, well, if we have four of these FMAs and the latency is three, that latency is 12. So we need to find 12 of these guys together. How we are able to find more independent QFMAs? Well, let's look at the rows of C. Every one of these rows is independent. So we can map this into ZMM8, 9, 10, and so far. In this case, we have eight, so we will be able to cover eight cycles of latency. And this is how we end up with this particular kernel, where we are actually implementing different rows of C over different rows of A by reducing the same rows of B, which is a particularly interesting property that we are using in the market architecture to increase the performance and, and reduce the power. The second part of the magic source of Knight's Mill is the new data type, which is what we call VNI16, which at the end uh, we can do all the marketing in the world, but it's not groundbreaking, right? It's just an evolution of things that we already had all the way from SSC2. It's just the realization that now we can use it very effectively for deep learning training. Which is the trick about VNNI? The trick is that we have variable precision. The inputs and the outputs are different. We are using 16-bit inputs and 32-bit outputs. In a way, we are claiming that this is the best of both worlds. First, we are getting the same performance as using half precision, because of course, the, the signal throughput depends on the data size. But on the other hand, since we, we are doing this Horizontal dot product, basically we are multiplying every one of these 16 bits of slots to get a 32-bit temporal result, and then we are adding together before getting the, the addition into the final accumulator. Basically, we are just doing the dot product, but in an horizontal way. Well, by doing that, basically the output is 32 bits, which have very nice properties to compare with floating point 32. Basically, we are going back to fixed point, just like the old times, which is the trade-off. Well, the obvious trade-off is that we have the overhead of handling the dynamic range in software, which is something that actually we need to do anyway, because sometimes, depending on the topologies, the IEEE ranges, for instance, in half precision, are actually quite in inadequate. So no magic then in 2 by 2 equal 4, right? How we are getting 4x by adding together the pipeline level parallelism of QFMA plus the SIMD parallelism of VNNI into what we call QVNNI, which is basically getting a QFMA construct, but every one of these FMAs now it's able to do a VNNI 
52-bit micro operation. So I really wanted to focus on instructions. I will give a little bit of discussion about the night's meal call, but the, the, the data will be in the slides anyway. It's, let's make no mistake, it's an enhanced night's landing call. It's a two-way superscalar execution machine. It has four-way SMT. We have every tile, two cores, with uh, sharing one single one megabyte L2 that is able to provide 64 bytes of data every cycle. Th some things that are very interesting is that even if it's two-way in the front end, it's kind of like four-way in the back end. And the magic for that is because we have this technique called crack UOPS that come from the Atom wall, where basically, for instance, when we have a load up or we have an up store, or <clears throat> we basically we can um, send the same UOP to two different clusters that will be interpreted in a different way. For instance, a load up will be sent into the memory cluster that will understand this UOP as a load. And the same view will be sent to the BPU that will understand it as a, as a vector operation. This is how we multiply the, the perceived backend performance by 2x. And the beauty of QFMA is that we're also able to decode it into a single view. Op. When we send a single QFMA, it will see a single memory access of four scalars into the MEC, and then we'll see as a single collection of four FMAs into the BPU. As you can see, and as we will see in a, in a slide in a couple of minutes, that's a key thing of Knight's Mill. Right? We are able to overcompensate a little bit the problem of having a very narrow front end by packing more operations together into a single instruction. So this is the key slide that is trying to explain the surgical changes that we did in Knight's Mill compared with Knight's Landing. In Knight's, li Knight's Landing on the left, what you can see is the two different BPU ports that are, every one of those is able to execute SIMD with 512 bits. And as you can see, they are actually what we call combo units. They are able to do indistinctly either double precision or single precision. And of course, they do just vanilla FMAs because we didn't introduce this concept of pipeline level parallelism in Knight's Landing. What we did in Knight's Mill, it's basically this is a deep learning product. So we made UDP, but not as much. We removed one of the DP ports from P0, and that gave us enough space in order to fit four of these SPB and NI units that we are actually chaining in pipeline fashion. Of course, we are implementing QFMA instructions, but as you can see here in the hardware, we only have depth two. What we actually do is this concept of double pumping or double, pump, double passing, where a, basically the result of a single pass, it's able to L0 bypass again into the same hardware so we can recirculate, which is basically what this um, slide is showing, right? Typically, what we will do with a single FMA is we will schedule instruction, we will read from the register file, we will execute three cycles, of latency. With a QFMA, what we are doing is basically two passes, where we go through two different FMAs. So this is the first stack, this is the second stack. Remember, we are doubling the latency by also doubling the throughput. And then immediately after, we can reschedule the same instruction to do the third and the fourth FMA. So putting all together, it's very, very straightforward, right? We are Pitching Night's Mill to be an instruction, uh, a processor for deep learning that has some trade-offs. It has 2x the single precision performance, half the DP precision performance, and then 4x when we are able to use VNNI on deep learning training. And I'm way over time, so I will leave this to, to make questions. Thank you. So we have time for questions, so go uh, ahead. Sure, a uh, quick question. Uh, Gaurav Singh Zilings, uh, question on your positioning. It looks like the Xeon Phi is targeting training, while the FPGAs are targeting inference. Now, the Crest family that you had on the far right uh, seemed to be targeting both training and inference. So the question I had is when, how do you position the Crest family against the Phi when the Crest family is out? Would it replace the Xeon Phi's? How about the FPGAs? So, um, Nightcrit is for, for purely uh, a scale up, right? It's for someone that wants kind of like boutique appliances where time to train is the most fundamental concern. Cost is not important. Uh, Night's Mill is supposed to be hi hybrid. It's able to provide very good time to train, maybe not as good, but it's also able to scale out. Basically, you are able to uh, so solve the problem by just having more nodes. And the TCO story ends up being better, especially because you can use it for other things. For instance, for generic machine learning, which is quite capable.
Okay. And are you commenting on the Crest family's timeline? Uh, sorry, no, I cannot talk about this. Thanks so much. <laughs> sorry. Hi, Eric Quinnell, Samsung. Um, SSC4, you had an instruction called dot .product, DPPD, DPPS, and it, uh, it, for people outside of Intel, when should people reverse engineer things, there's something called the horizontal NAND problem. Um, I asked the same question here. You've fused a bunch of chained FMAs. I understand from a microarchitecture um, point of view, why not just leave it to the schedulers? Why put it in the ISA? Why, why make it where you have to retire a single instruction with precise exceptions you know, atomically? My opinionated statement is that it's very difficult to make it in floating point. It's very difficult to make the IEEE behavior make sense, and it's very difficult to make it uh, very optimized in hardware. Everything that it's horizontal interactions in floating point, it's always an admir. And that's why we struggled with DPPS, for instance, the instruction that you're talking about. And, and people that have toyed out with these instructions, they will see that the performance has been very spotty depending on the implementations. Right. This is fixed point. This is integer. We are able to do very, very nice implementation things underneath because everything becomes sure. much, much but more again, straightforward. Again, if you have the custom hardware, why the ISA then? Why not just leave it? Even, even with that, I don't understand why you put it in the ISA when you have fixed function hardware lined up for it. Why not just leave it to the scheduler? Uh, you're talking about Knight's Creat Knight's yes, Creat versus Knight's Mill? That's right. Well, in a way, basically, we are foreseeing that there will be this fusion of supercomputing and, and deep learning, right? We know that the main supercomputing centers are very interested in deep learning. They are uh, toying around with the idea, for instance, of de using deep learning to uh, predict the parameters that will be used for the more traditional physics simulations. And we are still a, a supercomputing-centric product. So we, for, for the time being, we need to be as good as in supercomputing as in deep learning. And that's something that accelerators will never be able to do, right? Accelerators will only be able to, go, to be good at deep learning. At the same time, we really believe in this TCO story, that basically people will be able to find the convenience of just basically scale out on more nightmill machines, especially the ones that will have other uses beyond deep learning. OK, thank, thank you. you. I have a very brief, brief question. Uh, this is David Powell from uh, I'm a VP Machine Learning at Wave Computing. I have a quick question. Uh, for your VNNN, uh, it is purely uh, fixed point 16 and 32? Yes. And for both for training and inference? Well, for, for inference, it, it works uh, flawlessly, yes. <laughs> Yeah, for inference, you could even go with smaller data types. Sure. Depends on the network and the classifications that have to be done. Correct. But uh, any comments on the training or? Well, it's a specifically, it's a specifically for training. OK. And, and we are starting to get very, very happy with the, with the results that we are getting. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Nathan Brookwood from Insight64. Uh, you referred to uh, the cores as being two-way out of order and four-way SMT. And what in particular is the two-way, what is the two in the two-way out of order and what is the four in four-way SMT? Right, sorry, referring? that's right, it's a little bit misleading. Well, what I mean by two-way uh, superscalar is that basically we are able to fetch, decode, and rename two instructions per cycle. But every cycle, we are able to choose uh, across four different uh, hardware contexts for hardware threads. So you have four threads compared with the typical Intel two-thread approach on SMT. Right. The throughput is basically two, but uh, we are able to increase the efficiency because we are able to interleave across threads. And that's because you've got all these extra bubbles and time to fill. That's right. It's always very difficult to fill up and not very aggressive out of our machine as and Skylet. Can you go? I want to go a little bit further into the VNNI uh, choices because it's only fixed point. Most people who are doing 16-bit for uh, inference are using 16-bit floating point. So why did you choose only to do integer? Well, it's, it's a very interesting question, right? But we, we actually believe that fixed point has a lot of values. First of all, it's the conversions, right? It's, we really love that the same data type is being able to use for inference and for training. But the second one is... Um, Basically, it becomes much simpler. And we have found that you need to handle the dynamic range in software anyway. Once you need to do it, floating point doesn't bring you that many advantages. OK, thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, Ronnie Krasinski from NVIDIA. I, I had similar questions that you answered about um, the, the integer versus floating point, <clears throat> but I guess as a follow-up, um, how, how are you integrating into the frameworks like TensorFlow or CAFE with integer right. training? Oh, I'm no longer projecting. Uh, basically, well, you of all people know that right, right now the software ecosystem for deep learning is heavily based on frameworks like Cafe, like TensorFlow. And underneath those, typically what, we, what the companies do is basically release uh, libraries, right? We, we have three sets of, of, of libraries. We have MKL, which is our uh, standard uh, math kernel library of primitives that are being enhanced with, with deep learning. And then we are releasing an open source one version, which is called MKL DNN. This is the one that is it's being integrated already in, 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 in TensorFlow and Cafe, for instance. And then there's a more generic set of, of uh, libraries which are called DAL, which are more like for machine learning. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Any more questions? I have one over there. Hi, Manas Pandal, NVIDIA. Can you give me a sense of the kind of bandwidth you're able to achieve through your IPM uh, for the DL workloads in your simulation? No, unfortunately, I cannot. Let me quote Night's Landing. I guess that's open. Night's Landing, it has close to a little bit lower than 500 gigabytes per second stream bandwidth from the IPM. A stream. OK, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? No? OK, thank the speaker. Thank you. So we've heard uh, from two talks from industry, and now we're going to move um, back to academia and to hear about an open source project. Um, th this is going to be uh, three speakers who are going to speak to different portions of the work that's been done. Uh, the, the first speaker, Scott Davidson, is a PhD student at UC San Diego working with Professor Michael Taylor. Uh, the second speaker will be Khaled Al-Hawaj, who's a PhD student at Cornell University working with Professor Christopher B Batten. And then Austin Rovinsky is a PhD student at the University of Michigan working with Professor Ronald Drislinski. So the title of their talk is Celerity, an Open Source RISC-V Tiered Accelerator Fabric. And our first speaker is Scott. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Davidson. Uh, I am from UC San Diego. I am here with my colleagues, uh, Khaled from Cornell and Austin from the University of Michigan. We're going to be presenting Celerity in Open Source Risk V Tiered Accelerator Fabric. Um, before I get into it, I want to just thank everybody that you see up here on the slide. Um, this project was done by around 20 graduate students and eight professors, and it was a large group effort. So I just want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, and with that, I'm going to jump in because uh, we have quite a bit to say, so I'll probably get going. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about accelerating high-performance embedded workloads. Um, these are things like uh, video decoding on mobile devices, uh, real-time computing vision for autonomous vehicles, uh, augmented reality is kind of a new and emerging uh, embedded workload that's pretty exciting. And there's two important uh, things that we want to stress about embedded workloads. The first is that they usually have extremely strict energy efficiency requirements. And the other is that they're constantly evolving. Um, developments and improvements are happening all the time. And so it's not enough just to make energy efficient implementations. We also need to make sure that we have uh, flexible implementations uh, for future upgradability. So before I go too much into that, I do want to talk a bit about the chip that we actually taped out. Um, so Celerity is a 25 millimeter squared SOC, taped out in TSMC 16 nanometer uh, FFC. Uh, it has about 385 million transistors. There's 511 RISC-V cores, uh, one binarized neural network. Uh, there's a few on-chip synthesizable PLLs and a DCD CLDO. And we're going to go into all these components in quite a bit more detail later. Um, unfortunately, the chip is not back yet. It comes back in September, so just a few more weeks. Uh, we're, we're pretty excited to get that back. Um, we put it on a 672-pin uh, uh, flip chip BGA. And the last point I really want to stress is that from PDK access, it only took us nine months to tape this chip out. And so we're going to get into that a bit more later as well and some of the strategies we used for that. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about the tiered accelerator fabric, um, what that is, and how we implemented that. Then we're going to go through a small case study to show how you actually take an embedded workload and map it to this tiered accelerator fabric. 
then we're going to talk a bit about how we met such uh, an aggressive time schedule. So getting back to the embedded workloads, um, in order to make sure that we attain both energy efficiency and flexibility, um, we need to decompose the embedded workload based on program characteristics. So things like operating systems, I.O. devices, highly irregular aspects to the workload, we really want to run on flexible and highly programmable hardware. And then as you look into the workload, you're going to find bits that are a bit more regular. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to extract some energy efficiency by exploiting parallelism. And then finally, there's going to be parts of your workload that are highly regular. And so we're going to try to attain magnitude uh, of energy efficiency by building fixed function accelerators for that. And so we proposed the tiered accelerator fabric. And in short, it's an architectural template that is designed to map these uh, embedded workloads onto distinct tiers based on those program characteristics. And this is going to help us uh, attain those energy efficiency requirements, but still maintain flexibility for the future when we need to upgrade. So to go over what the tiers are, the first tier we call the general purpose tier. Um, this is where you do general purpose computation. But more importantly, you get control flow for the entire SSC and memory management. The next tier is the massively parallel tier. Um, this is where we're going to try to uh, exploit the fine and coarse grain parallelism to get some energy efficiency over just running everything on the general purpose tier. And then the final tier is the specialization tier. And this is where we make sure that we're going to meet those energy efficiency requirements by building fixed functional units. And so similar to how we took the embedded workload and decomposed it onto the spectrum, kind of from flexible to energy efficient hardware, we kind of encompass that in the uh, tiered accelerator fabric. So how did we actually do this in Celerity? Um, so I'm going to go tier by tier and explain what we actually put in Celerity to achieve the tiered accelerator fabric. So the first tier is the general purpose tier. Um, if you recall, that's like general purpose computation uh, and operating systems. Uh, in Celerity, we used uh, five RISC-V rocket cores. Um, this comes from the FreeChips project. They're five-stage in-order scalar processors. Um, and they run Linux, which is really nice for us. Um, if we want to run TCP IP networking stacks, uh, we have that at our hand. Um, it also has exception handling and control flow for the entire SSC. And it also provides a cache memory hierarchy for the entire SSC. Uh, the next uh, tier is the massively parallel tier. Um, and so in Celerity, we decided uh, to put a many-core array. Um, this is a 496-core array uh, with low-power RISC-V cores that we developed in-house. We call them vanilla five cores. They are also five-stage in-order scalar cores. But unlike the rocket core, uh, the vanilla five cores are 40 times smaller in area. And so, uh, and they can talk to the adjacent cores over 80 gigabit full duplex length. And we were able to get uh, these cores running at over a gigahertz on the SOC. And so some interesting aspects of the many core, um, it uses a remote store programming uh, model. Um, and this gives us uh, a MIMD programming model, which really helps us get fine grained parallelism um, throughout the many core. It also has a really tight producer consumer synchronization through uh, what we call the token queue. This is an architectural primitive that basically allows cores to reserve buffer space in another core and store multiple words before the core starts to access those. And so this gives us a streaming programming model as well, which can help us achieve quite a lot of parallelism. And so this slide is to help me explain why we call it the massively parallel uh, tier. Um, what we mean by that is we're really trying to push how many physical threads per unit area we have. So we're comparing it uh, against a couple of hot chip alumni. Um, we have the open Python tiles, uh, raw tiles, and we also threw the Meow GPU uh, compute unit uh, to give it you know, some comparison with a slightly different architecture. And you can see that um, the uh, Celerity many core tile was able to achieve a, a pretty good bump in number of physical threads per unit area. And so the final tier is the specialization tier. Um, this is where we were going to make sure that we meet those energy efficiency requirements. And so in Celerity, we used a binaryized neural network. Um, this is an energy efficient implementation of a convolutional neural network. 
It has nine total layers with a 13.4 uh, megabyte model size, and we do batch norm calculations after each one of these layers to make sure that our accuracy is good. And so just as a, as a final note, um, uh, just to make sure that all these tiers can work well together and communicate well together, we have multiple parallel links that tie them together to make sure that's not a bottleneck. And so with that, I'm going to hand the mic off to Khaled uh, to talk a bit about uh, how you map these embedded workloads onto the tiered accelerated fabric. Thanks, Scott. Uh, hello, my name is Khaled from Cornell University, and I'll be discussing a case study that illustrates how to map applications to the tiered accelerator fabric that Scott has just introduced. So for our case study, we were interested in exploring an, a, uh, an emerging application domain with aggressive performance and energy targets. To this end, we chose image recognition for embedded systems using convolutional neural networks. The figure shows a typical convolution neural networks where the input on the left is an image that goes through multiple layers, and the output on the right is a predicted classification. Uh, each layer takes as an input a multidimensional array of input activations. Multiply those activations by a set of weights to produce a multidimensional array of output activations. The weights are trained offline so that each layer can recognize specific set of features, and together all the layers enable classifying the image. We use a three-step process to map application to the tiered accelerator fabric. In the first step, we implement the algorithm on the general purpose tier. And after characterizing the application, in the second step, we improve performance by using either the massively parallel tier or the specialization tier. And finally, in the third step, we improve performance further by using both the massively parallel tier and the specialization tier. So let's apply the three-step process to image recognition to understand how to map application to the tiered accelerator fabric. Uh, the first one is to realize the algorithm as an application on the general purpose tier. There are many ways to implement a CNN, but one uh, key design decision is the precision of weights and activations. Machine learning experts have recently shown that even single bit weights and activations can achieve good accuracy. For example, this specific network was proposed by Corbarrier et al., and it has single bit, weights, uh, single bit weights and activations, and it's still able to achieve 89.8% on CIFAR 10 data set. In this case study, we focus on exploring this binarized neural network, or BNN, and we set for ourselves an ultra-low latency performance target with a throughput of 60 classifications per second. Then we characterize the implementation of the BNN on the general purpose tier. I don't have much time to go through the details, but the big takeaway of this slide is that the general purpose tier is, way, is far too slow to meet the performance target. And in fact, our analysis shows that we need to consider all layers for, for acceleration in order to achieve the performance target. Using the massively parallel tier is an option here for acceleration. However, we, in this case study, we decided to focus on the specialization tier first. Uh, this shows the microarchitecture of the BNN accelerator as it is implemented in the specialization tier. It consists of four main units, uh, the control unit, which handles the rock command interface, the memory unit, which handles the rock memory interface, the buffer unit, and the compute unit. Uh, I'll go through a simple example to illustrate the interaction between the different units where the BNN accelerator is configured to uh, process a single binarized convolutional layer. Uh, note that the input activations have already been produced by a previous layer execution. In the beginning, the, the attached rocket core uses a set of command of, of rock command messages to configure the location of the weights in the memory, the number of weights, the size of the layer, and other necessary details. Then the memory unit uses the DMA engine to send memory read requests through the rock memory interface for the weights. Then the weights start streaming to the accelerator through the MPAC unit into the weights buffer. And after we read all the weights, the binary convolution compute unit starts reading the input activations as well as the weights to produce the output activations. Note, one benefit of using binarized neural network is that multiplication in convolution is just a simple XOR operation. Finally, the newly generated output activations will serve as input activations for subsequent layer execution. Now, to implement this BNN accelerator, we considered either using a traditional manual RTL design methodology or using high-level synthesis, HLS. Ultimately, we decided on using HLS as we are under significant uh, time pressure. And also, the BNN algorithm is relatively new. Thus, we envisioned significant design space exploration. 
the flow on the left shows our HLS design methodology. We developed a system C model for the entire BNN accelerator with all its units. Then we used Stratus HLS to transform the system C models to RTL. We also developed a set of wrappers and adapters in our Python-based hardware modeling framework, PyMetal, uh, that will allow the BNN accelerator to communicate with the rest of the system. Then we used PyMetal to compose the BNN RTL with the wrappers and adapters to generate the final RTL, which will be used as a single block for the rest of the system. Retrospectively, after using HLS design methodology to design a complex accelerator, we found that the HLS have multiple uh, strengths and weaknesses. HLS enabled us to quickly implement the BNN accelerator with the initial design ready in just a few weeks. Uh, this allowed us more time to utilize the HLS core simulation and perform rapid design exploration, which is always helpful, especially for an emerging application such as the BNN. HLS helped in timing closure. We were able to improve clock frequency by 43% in just a few days. Uh, we also mitigated timing issues at the interfaces late at the design cycle with the help of latency and sensitive design and pipeline register insertion. However, HLS tools are still evolving. For example, it, it took us over six weeks to, uh, to debug an issue with the tool that related to the data-dependent accesses to arrays. Now let's consider how does the BNN accelerator fits into the full SOC. Uh, our initial design used the general purpose tier for weight storage. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Our, our initial design used the general purpose tier for weight storage. However, the limited capacity in the level one cache for the general purpose tier resulted in increase of, in the off-chip memory, memory traffic. Now, to reduce the, to reduce the, the to enhance performance and to reduce the expensive off-chip memory traffic, we can attach, for example, a large level two to the general purpose tier, or maybe even add more storage to the BNN accelerator. However, we have almost 16 megabits of data available in the, mass, in the massively parallel tier. While we could have the BNN accelerator directly access the storage, this will incur significant latencies. Instead, we propose a novel approach where each core in the massively parallel tier leverages the uh, remote store programming model of the massively parallel tier. Each core in the massively parallel tier waits for its turn to execute a small program that would read the weights from its local data memory and send them through a network on chip to the BNN in just the right order. And once a core finishes its turn, it basically signals its neighbor to start doing the same. And the process continues until we finish one column, the next column, and eventually a complete row, followed by subsequent rows. To quantify the performance benefits of our approach, we spent some time optimizing a software baseline that will run on the general purpose tier. And we evaluated the baseline using a RISC-V ISA simulator with an optimistic IPC of 1. Then we performed a full system RTL simulation of the BNN accelerator to analyze its performance. We found that the specialization tier alone is able to improve performance by two orders of magnitude. And cooperatively using the specialization tier and the massively parallel tier is improve performance further, but more importantly, reduces the energy expensive memory access, uh, off-chip memory accesses. And now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Austin. Thanks. Thank you, Khaled. Hello, everyone. I'm Austin Rovinsky from the University of Michigan. And I want to change gears a little bit and talk about the design process for Celerity. So Celerity was designed under the DARPA Craft program. And the goal of this program was to reduce the amount of time it takes for uh, tape out from design all the way to tape out. And so while we focus today on the architecture that we presented for accelerating um, embedded workloads, we also had to focus on meeting constraints of the DARPA program, as well as fully utilizing our all academic team. So the techniques that we created to address this were not simply about how to make a complex SOC. It was about how to make a complex SOC in nine months, using only grad students as our engineers, who are spread across four different locations and two different time zones, working in an advanced FinFET node for the first time, and with a total budget of $1.3 million. So to meet this broad set of constraints, we had to develop a number of techniques, which we've categorized into three different categories, reuse, modularize, and automate the design flow. And over the next few slides, I'll be talking about in more depth and several instances of in which we use these techniques. The first and probably most important is reuse. Not only reuse of our own designs through extensibility and parameterization, 
but also the reuse of open source designs and infrastructure. In terms of open source, we reused every component of the base jump library, which includes things like parameterizable IP cores, a silicon tested BGA package, and IO ring, as well as PCB test boards for post silicon validation. We also use the open source RISC V ISA for our ISA in the chip, which enable us to use the rocket core for our control tier, as well as to create an in house vanilla V core, which we used in our massively parallel tier. Aside from being able to reuse the core designs in those, the big win came from being able to inherit the open source infrastructure that came with RISC-V, which included the testing infrastructure and tool chain. Naturally, from using the RISC-V ISA, we also used the ROC interconnect, which is an open source interconnect that we use to connect all the three tiers that we presented today. In terms of extensibility, we found that including extensibility in our own designs right from the very beginning uh, was very critical in the design process. And the clearest example of this is that towards the end of our tape out, in the very last month, we performed area optimizations that enabled us to drastically reduce the area of some of our modules. By just editing nine lines of code, we were able to change our many core from 400 cores to 496 cores. And we were able to validate, synthesize, place, route, and sign off this new design in just three days. So by including extensibility in our design from the very beginning, we were able to achieve a higher level of performance in a very short time frame. The next technique that I want to talk about is modularization. And this can basically be summed up as the agile design methodology as it applies to hardware. So beyond just starting with the base level components, iterating on them, and building up to a top level design, it was also about using a Scrum-like methodology for task management. And what I mean by that is that we broke up our tasks um, into uh, different tasks that uh, any of our team members could pull. And so regardless of whether it was a validation task or a physical design task or um, any other type of task, um, any engineer that was available to do it could pull the task. And so not only did this allow us to much more highly utilize our team, but it also allowed us to um, be able to um, break, down, um, break down the tasks and more finer granularity. We also uh, focused on establishing interfaces early. And not only in terms of our design interfaces for components on the chip, also the interfaces from different design teams and from task to task. So in terms of the interfaces that we use between components, we started from the very beginning by setting up the ROC interface as well as the base jump interface for on-chip and off-chip communication. And by doing this, it uh, allowed us to use latency insensitive interfaces so that regardless of any underlying architecture changes of the components, as well as um, any timing sensitivity of the components, uh, we could keep the same uh, interface between the modules and not worry about any, any impact on the other components. In terms of uh, design interfaces between the teams, we set up very early um, the set of deliverables that had to be delivered from, depending on what task it was, and from one team to another. And the big one here was that it allowed us to reduce the amount of synchronization that we had to do um, via email, conference calls, what have you, uh, to, in order to um, greatly accelerate the design and not worry about as much synchronization between teams. The third category that we used was automation. And anyone that's uh, taped out a chip recently knows that the tools these days are very highly automated. But in order to meet the tight uh, time constraints of the DARPA craft program, we had to even take this a step further. And so in terms of frameworks and libraries, we had to start from the very beginning with the BSG IP cores library, which is a set of validated IP cores, and build up our more complex RTL components from there. We created an abstract implementation flow such that any design that we wanted to push through the flow could be pushed through with a minimum amount of changes in our, um, for this flow. And we also used uh, the PyMetal framework in order to validate uh, a lot of the wrappers and interfaces between different components to accelerate the um, creation of test uh, infrastructure as well as testing interfaces. In terms of the tools that we used, we also, as Khaled mentioned earlier, 
used high-level synthesis in order to accelerate the amount of time it took for um, both the design space exploration and the implementation of our BNN. And while we haven't talked about it a lot, we also used analog components on this chip. And we actually used a digital design flow in order to create these analog components. And so for example, one of the components we had on this chip was a fully synthesizable PLL. And by fully synthesizable, I mean it was started in RTL, went through synthesis, and automated place and route. And then working with our analog design engineers, we were able to uh, run simulations on it, feed back uh, the metrics that we got back into the RTL, and iterate on that until we got um, a design that met our design specifications. We also included a uh, mostly synthesizable LDO. And by mostly synthesizable, uh, all of the control logic was able to be synthesized and placed and routed uh, fully automatically. And the only custom components we had were some uh, custom power transistors. And this was actually uh, taped out uh, earlier in this process in the 65 nanometer node. And there's a publication on this this past year at, uh, or this year rather, at ISSCC. So you can look at that publication for more details on the architecture. So to wrap things up, what we've presented here today is a tiered accelerator fabric, which is an architectural template that we can be applied for embedded workloads to maintain, to maintain high performance while also allowing energy efficiency and high programmability. We presented Celerity, which is an implementation of this tiered accelerator fabric, and it allowed us a case study into an embedded application, which is, in our case, low latency flexible image recognition. And we also developed a set of techniques that allowed a small team of grad students, at least small team relatively, to tape out an advanced node in a very tight time constrained period. And one more note that I want to mention is that if you notice, uh, we have open source in the title of our talk. And that's not just because we use a lot of open source components. Uh, I'm happy to announce that in the coming months, we'll be open sourcing all of the RTL that went into this chip. Um, so lastly, I'd like to offer our thanks to DARPA, who sponsored this project uh, under the CRAFT program. A special thanks to Dr. Linton Salmon, who provided the program support and coordination. Uh, so thank you very much, and we can take any questions. Bring all the speakers back and open it up for questions. We can start right there. Hi, right, Nathan Brookwood. Uh, that's an impressive achievement. You should all be proud of yourselves. Uh, my question is kind of a weird one. Uh, about 30 years ago, probably before any of you were born, uh, there was a mini supercomputer company in San Diego called Celerity. And I'm wondering if there's any linkage at all between the Celerity of the late 80s and what you're doing now, a thesis advisor or something like that, maybe. Uh, so not exactly, um, as much as that would be fun. The name Celerity is mostly, uh, it has to do with uh, accelerating embedded workloads. So, because Celerity is like swift, quick. So and it's also about how quickly we're able to achieve the tape. So there's no linkage at all, no human linkage. Not that I'm aware of. That name. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Well, I thought it was an interesting coincidence. Okay, we can take a question over there. Hello, um, Howard Mao from UC Berkeley, and uh, so uh, we also were doing a, a project which is funded by the CRAFT program. So I mean, congratulations on uh, completing your yours. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, could you explain again how you're using the the highly parallel tier to accelerate the the weight storage for the specialized tier? Um, so is it only being used basically to hold the weights and shuttle them across from the memory? This, is there any computation being done? like pre-processing being done by the parallelization layer? Uh, that, that's a good question. While, in theoretically speaking, you can, for example, perform some pre-processing in the massively parallel tier as you are streaming the weights, we are performing something like stitching where we know that our accelerator needs to access a couple of weights successively. So we basically replicate and instead of read that weights multiple times, we just send it multiple times. But we're not doing anything fancy. We're just basically streaming the weights in just the right order. And we're doing simple stitching between different layer execution where we know some data overlaps. Uh, and this was like not possible to deal with a fix, more fixed function 
uh, memory. So as I said in the presentation, we could have added more storage to the BNN accelerator, but we found it more fitting to utilize the massively parallel tier oh, yeah, in that actually. way. So um, sorry, so the second question is uh, about, uh, I guess, validation. So when we were doing our own craft project, we spent a lot of time on, on validation. And this is something, we, a recurring thing that we do with a lot of our chips that we, that we designed using the Agile Harvard methodology. So uh, could you talk a bit more about how you value this, like, uh, this chip? Like what, you, you had a slide where you talked about these, like using pie metal to these high level Things. What exact, like what sort of like validation mm -hmm. so, uh, methodologies were enabled by it? Yeah, and, and this is also a good question. Uh, we spent a lot of time early on in the project to basically outline our validation plan and what kind of tests we will have. And we had almost around, I think, 400 uh, benchmarks that we run to validate the chip in different areas, whether it's to validate the processor or to validate the BNN or to validate the BNN with the processor and the BNN with, with the many core. Uh, we used a lot of system C simulation basically to validate the functionality. Then we relied on the fact that when you transform the system C code to be the RTL, the tool will be faithful to you. But we also perform RTL simulations. Uh, for, the, for, for the pipe metal part, we had some extra uh, modules that we designed in Pi Metal, and we designed the test also in Pi Metal. Uh, but you know, we can meet after this offline, and we can discuss in details. Thank you. Uh, I would also just like to add that we used the BSG IP Core library, and so that gave us unit testing on a pretty fine level. So a lot of the modules at the module level were already pre-tested, and we could just do regression testing on that. And so we could just really focus on integration testing for the higher level chip. Oh, I see. And uh, one last thing, just for the physical validation, because of course, you know, there's all types of validation. Um, that looks pretty similar to what an industry flow would look like. We use, you know, a lot of tools from the big three EDA providers uh, for that flow. Congratulations again. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Hey, uh, Colin Schmidt from UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm excited that you guys are open sourcing RTL, and I was wondering if you had any plans on open sourcing any of the automation you did for the back end scripts. Um, we would love to, but unfortunately, a lot of that relies on um, things that are copyrighted from uh, the EDA providers. So we did uh, thoroughly consider that, but unfortunately, we're not able to at this time. So, so you don't, just to clarify, you don't have any layer on top of the scripts that's running it. It's just your main. We do. Um, I would say it's highly intertwined, so, and we did consider it. And yeah, again, unfortunately, we can't do it at this time. Okay, thanks. Dan Ernst from Craig. Nice achievement, guys, first off. Um, I, a question about the process. Is there any way you can quantify what amount of time was spent during the nine months on um, different tasks, you know, PD versus logic design versus verification versus everybody's favorite thing, which is making your tools work the right way? Um, can you quantify a little bit how time was spent between those items? Um. Yeah, I think so. Um, actually, as part of the craft program, we had to identify exactly the number of engineering hours that we had uh, to spend on different components. And unfortunately, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. But I would say um, probably you know, a significant amount. I would say it's probably not that different from what you would see in an industry breakdown in terms of percentages. Uh, I think there was a good amount of reduction from uh, the amount of time that we had to spend on design because of how much effort we put into both HLS and using BSG IP cores. Um, but there was still a significant amount in verification, I would say, even though we did speed it up. All right, so the reduction was fairly, I don't want to say constant, but there was reduction in all phases. Um, I would say yes, that design. sounds about right. OK, thank you. I think we have time for one more quick question. Yeah, uh, Oliver Gunasekera, NG Codec. So uh, quick question, did you use FPGA verification to get faster? turnaround speeds, and, and also which HLS uh, compiler did you use? Uh, I can answer the first one. Um, so we actually have a development board that we use for a lot of uh, our ASIC designs. And so uh, we have a board that has an FPGA so that we can do emulation. And then we use the pretty much the same board to pop our ASIC on and actually use that exact same board for bring up. And so we were able to, prior to tape out, put various components in FPGA to do uh, some small, you know, 
uh, I think we were able to get like a single rocket core and a small mini core going on there. But the entire design was a bit too big for that particular dev board that we were using. And as for the uh, HLS tool, we use Cadence Stratus HLS. Thank you. Great. Welcome. Let's thank our speakers again. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. So that brings us to the final talk, both of the session and of the day. So thank you very much, everyone who's been um, still staying to hear our last and final talk. Uh, we're going to go from more traditional processors to uh, a, a, new, a newer type of processor. Uh, both, uh, it been, it's been there, and it's definitely um, re-emerging. And to talk about this is Val Cook. Val Cook uh, is currently the chief software architect architect at ThinkEye. Previously, he was at Intel for uh, 16 years, working on their, on their architecture teams for the Xeon Phi and GPU teams. He graduated with a BS in electrical engineering and an MS in computer science from Brigham Young University. And the title of his talk is The Graph Streaming Processor, A Next Generation Computing Architecture. And with that, Val. Thank you, Stuart. I'm excited to be here, and thanks for sticking around. Let me give you the real quick introduction. We're, uh, we're still consider ourselves in a startup. We're about a 70-man team. We're pretty much all engineers, and, uh, and uh, we're excited to get a sort of a clean uh, sheet of paper to really look at the challenges and the problems that exist today and how one might address that with, uh, with that opportunity. Uh, we pronounce ourselves ThinkEye, and uh, we're developing new silicon focused on machine learning, uh, computer vision, other strategic data parallel local workloads. We're, we're funded and backed primarily with strategics, automotive industry being one of those key uh, backers. Um, one of the key innovations that you'll see as we walk through some of these slides is, is also on the software side. Uh, one of our larger teams is actually the compiler team. And, and uh, bringing a, a new architecture to, uh, to the industry requires uh, high-grade tools. And, and you'll see that as being an important piece. Um, Currently, uh, streaming is uh, uh, one of our key IP areas, uh, also in the, in the compiler, as I mentioned. The status, we have uh, silicon coming back end of the year. Um, we're in early access engagements on simulators, FPGAs, emulators, and so forth with some strategic partners. And uh, I don't know, we're excited to, to be here and have a chance to present. The main objective here is at a fairly high level and then diving as deep as we can in the time we have. Um, is to talk about the philosophy, really, that we, that we employed as we went through the architecture. We have a little glitzy uh, video here. I'll just take a second to... Oh, it looks like we're missing the audio. So hopefully the idea, our artistic folks uh, tried to send a message here, is that we really looked at multiple levels of parallelism, um, multiple techniques, and with really, a, a, and I focused on this objective, to achieve exceptional efficiency. And uh, we feel like that that's the key to uh, low power. We feel like that's a key to uh, really delivering the performance that's needed. One of the things you'll notice as we walk through this, we'll, we'll be focused primarily as a company in edge computing, uh, with emphasis in low power and high throughput. Uh, architecturally, there's no reason that we've chosen that, but clearly we see it as a strong advantage in terms of market growth into the future, as well as a, a key advantage that we feel like we bring to the table in this space. So looking at levels of parallelism, we've talked about that in multiple presentations today. The key one that, that you probably haven't seen um, that, that we want to discuss in detail is this idea of task-level parallelism. It's uh, possible, it's available in many architectures, and the key message you'll see here is that we execute it directly. We define tasks in the form of a task graph or a data flow graph, and uh, implementing that at the hardware level as a, a fundamental unit of execution is, is a key message you'll hear. 
Second is thread level parallelism. Again, a common technique, GPUs are, are, are well acquainted with this concept. Um, a couple of unique ideas you'll see here as we walk through this as well in uh, making sure that the hardware scheduling can address this clearly. Data level parallelism, a couple of unique ideas here. We don't run a simple linear vector, we run 2D blocks or 2D uh, vectors, if you will, as well as uh, uh, parallel reduction types of instructions. And, and finally, instruction level parallelism, you'll see some new levels of, of, uh, of hardware, instruction scheduling, and, and some of the complexities and, and benefits that come with that. So task level parallelism. The idea here, first of all, is, is what is a task graph? The concept is really a, a formalization of, of tasks, of task level parallelism in a form that, that can give the compiler tools as well as the developers uh, clear delineations between inputs and outputs, reduction and side effects, the kinds of things that can make systems complex to, to accelerate in, in highly efficient fashion, but done in a way that's industry supported and in a way that's um, simple to program, that you're not at the assembly level here, you're not needing very specific domain expertise, but are able to program your device clearly. So a task graph, nodes, buffers between the nodes, uh, clearly defined inputs and outputs at each node. Nodes are bound to kernels or programs that, that uh, operate on those. And uh, the data buffers can be structured or unstructured, they can be dense or sparse, and all of those kinds of things uh, are, are certainly there. So in, in much the way that uh, von Neumann architectures from decades ago sort of had an instruction pointer and a, and a program counter and a couple of bits of compare state to define your machine, and as things have evolved, we've got you know, hundreds, thousands of, of instruction pointers and so forth, and if you look at sort of that trend, we believe really the next piece is to give the hardware more knowledge about the work that it's doing. And in the context of ThinkEye, the hardware knows what a task graph is. You one MMIO write from the software side, the task graph gets executed, the data streams we'll discuss, and uh, you get notified when you're done. And interaction with the host is minimal, um, management of the, of the memory and the load balancing throughout the machine is, is all managed by the hardware. Uh, one more plug for uh, uh, machine learning frameworks. They're clearly the, the flavor of the month in terms of of programming and machine learning. I suspect this will both diversify and focus all at the same time, meaning that we'll need more generalized programming mechanisms, and a few of the folks you see on this slide will, will dominate. Um, graphs. Today, if you look at, uh, to my knowledge, every one of the frameworks that you just saw, as well as many of the libraries provided by significant vendors in the industry, um, execute task graphs uh, serially, sequentially. So, uh, for example, the scheduling uh, algorithms underneath TensorFlow schedule one node at a time, calling various libraries to perform operations, blahs or, or various DNN libraries and so forth. And, and the acceleration models schedule linearly node at a time. The communication vehicle is, of course, memory, and, and uh, moving that data off and on chip has a, has a, a clear cost to that. Um, contrasting that with ThinkEye, uh, two things happen. First of all is our compilers uh, really a, a two-tiered optimizing compiler. Uh, it's fully auto-vectorizing everything you would expect a compiler to do uh, for your kernels, but it also does a, a tremendous amount of static analysis on the kernels. That metadata, if you will, is rolled up to a higher level optimizing compiler. And in that compiler, we see um, the data dependencies analyzed. We see the... Uh, flow, the buffer resource allocations, and so forth for the intermediate buffers are determined by this, this second level compiler, and these structures are provided to the hardware. Now, let me be careful here in one piece. The hardware does all of the execution. It's fully dynamic, so the hardware receives uh, the description of the task graph, but the scheduling of the data through the machine is not static. It is, in fact, dynamic, and we um, allow the hardware to fully optimize scheduling and resources. That gives you opportunities for kernels to run with disparate lengths of time and, and, and so forth and, and, and be able to minimize the footprint in the machine of the in-flight work and, and still retain high utilization. Thread level parallelism. So the idea here, and this is a, a, a very simple block diagram, um, in, the, in the upper left what you see is uh, 
um, an advanced scheduler. This is uh, one of the key innovations that we feel like the industry will benefit from. And this is the piece where you take a fairly traditional looking, if you will, uh, group of processors and, and sort of schedule work across those processors in, uh, um, in, in a data dependent, highly streamed fashion. The uh, key pieces here, however, is that the scheduler understands the data dependencies. So rather than pushing the task of, of uh, poor choice of words, uh, rather than, than pushing the responsibility of performing task level scheduling and parallelism to the software developers, the hardware is allowed to do that. He understands the data dependencies, he understands the flow of the data through the machine, and in that advanced scheduler, we can see um, various units of work executing throughout the entire machine, and I'll show that in a, in a graph subsequently here. Uh, the last bullet is a key point. Um, an, an analogy, of, of course, is that in many of these SIMD-style machines today, we have scatter-gather units for the data path. It turns out that it's a tremendous value to have a, an analogous concept for control, to be able to, to scatter uh, threads of execution and gather and aggregate those threads. And, uh, and, and so the hardware provides mechanisms for that in a similar fashion. Uh, this graph might help. Um, this is a real trace from some real uh, analysis we did for, for uh, some customers. The concept here is that the, the graph on the left is color-coded with, with the colors uh, in, in the graph on the right. And uh, the idea here is that in the vertical axis are, are just monotonically increasing ID numbers assigned to each thread of execution. Each dot in the graph is actually a little horizontal line. It represents sort of the start time and stop time of each thread of execution. So you can see in this particular case, many nodes or many threads are, are executing through the first node or the root node of our task graph. And uh, he is initiating additional threads down through the graph in, in this case, even conditional fashion. And uh, that processing occurs fully concurrently. So you see some initial startup, if you will, in, in the blue graph, and as soon as sufficient amount of data is, is prepared and in flight, then we immediately start executing downstream data through the network. Tremendous value here, as you see the, the distance, both in time and in, in, in space, from the producer and the consumers is fully managed by the hardware and fully scheduled by the hardware to achieve uh, very high efficiencies in terms of uh, uh, overall system utilization. Data level parallelism. So in, uh, in the data level parallelism side, two key pieces come here. Um, I'll talk to these with a little more detail than you see on the screens, but uh, the persistent data structures throughout the memory hierarchy are actually block-based. So you'll see uh, um, two-dimensional and one-dimensional support throughout those data structures. What does that mean realistically? It means we can read vertically through our register files. It means we can pull rectangular blocks of data out of our register files with offsets on every instruction. And uh, that gives you some key interesting um, advantages. One of those is that, that uh, many of the instructions that get executed today in our kernels um, fall in the category of necessary but not making forward progress. Shifting data, aligning, swizzling, format converting. Those kinds of instructions are key. We like to measure them when we measure efficiency, right? Data valid, strobed against cycles. But uh, are we really making forward progress on, this, on, the, uh, on the algorithm or the, or the work at hand? And so being able to, to access data in place. Um, many, of our, uh, many of our programs look very simply, block load some data, operate on it in place in the register file, and then store that data back. And uh, that ability to, to not be continuously moving and shifting that data is, uh, is powerful. Um, next concept, the uh, idea of reduction instructions. We've heard some things uh, from several winners earlier today, this idea of being able to take a larger source and reduce that. The uh, Intel FMA concept is a similar concept. The, uh, the key piece here, however, is that once you project that into two-dimensional space, and once you do that in a highly efficient unified arithmetic pipeline, I haven't mentioned, but uh, our, our pipeline is, is unified. It supports 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit integer, as well as 32 and 64-bit float. And uh, using a unified pipeline has some advantages and disadvantages. Of course, you save on the area, on the multipliers, and so forth but you, you pay some penalties in terms of being able to feed that infrastructure. Particularly, you pick a sweet spot and you say, I'm going to run at 
some width matched to my memory subsystem of, of vector or in our case block size and uh, and then as you move down in data sizes uh, we chose 32 as you move down to 16 and 8 bit you end up sort of running your your multiplier hardware fallow and it's not a fault of the of the multipliers it's simply that you can't pull the data out of your your uh, persistent data structures register files and whatnot quickly enough and and so there are various techniques multiple register files and 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 various techniques that are employed in the industry today to, to try to beat that problem but a simple and clean answer is actually to be able to provide reduction instructions. And we have a full complement of those from dot products to min max, logical ors and ands and so forth. And, and uh, in these reduction instructions, what you attain is the ability to overlap your source data with your destination data. So you'll see in our pipelines that uh, our, our vector pipelines have, for example, uh, Wallace trees underneath them for addition. And the cost of those in in area versus the value gained in uh, in reduction instruction throughput is tremendous. Um, our eight bit through our eight bit data uh, integer data ops fully utilize the multipliers uh, in the under the reduction instructions with no no fallow hardware. Uh, that's valuable. And uh, if you look at most uh, traditional architectures, you'll see sort of a two x reduction uh, in terms of peak integer ops as you go from say 32 bit to 16 bit and, and and so forth. All right, instruction level parallelism. Um, again, a fairly simple slide here. Um, we chose to do a couple of key things, and you saw this early in the, in the high-level diagram. Uh, rather than sort of a place and step approach to uh, putting down processors, which is again popular, um, we chose to really look at the problem from some key, key directions. One of those was, uh, what kind of balancing do I need in terms of my floating point and, and integer pass versus my load store pass versus um, special arithmetic instructions? Um, we have things like histogram instructions and, and median filters and, and, and various instructions that are quite painful to implement um, in specialized places, but you don't need those at the same kind of throughput that you would need with uh, you know, a, a traditional arithmetic pipeline. And so by picking these pipelines carefully and then sharing them across groups of four processors, we gain some key advantages. And then there are some uh, structural advantages as well. We, we frequently use embedded blocks, for example, for our persistent structures rather than, than latches and flops. Big key message here, however, is by looking at this, you put yourself in a position where a fully hardware scheduled uh, thread picker, or instruction picker, rather, um, can, can look at hundreds of threads, the on-deck candidate instructions against tens of pipelines, and, and schedule that work with this very high ratio of, in terms of utilization. And uh, granted, there's a complexity there that, that, that better yield something, in, and it clearly does. And we'll see in a couple of slides. The, uh, the uh, mapping for all of those pipelines is, is uh, truly a large scale search, if you will, that can be done very effectively and very efficiently uh, done in hardware. Uh, comparing that to VLIW approaches, for example, um, tremendous power savings in the VLIW, moving much of that work to compile time, but in a highly threaded environment, you lose quite a bit of efficiency in terms of uh, uh, ability to schedule across threads and, and fill those pipelines. Finally, the, the programming model. We've talked a little bit about that. A um, couple of key pieces. Fully programmable, that seems to be the question of our era right now is to, uh, do we build fixed function convolution pipelines or do we build general purpose hardware? And, and some folks are here and some folks are here and, and it's gonna be an interesting thing to watch over the next year or two. Um, we've carefully and clearly chosen to stay fully programmable. And uh, we do that in the presence of, of rapid acceleration in terms of, of low precision inference, for example. We do that in the presence of uh, many changing uh, networks and the complexity and topologies of those networks also increasingly uh, dynamic and, and in their nature. And so we feel like it's the right choice. And uh, if you look at the efficiencies and the utilization numbers on the next slide here, you'll see that, that uh, it seems possible. It, uh, being able to really have and retain a fully programmable device without, uh, without choosing to build dedicated hardware, for example, for convolutions. Um, next piece, in terms of uh, programming it specifically, 
We've chosen three machine learning frameworks uh, out the door with our initial releases at the end of the year. Um, TensorFlow, uh, we've, we've, of course, looked at the, the environment there. It schedules node at a time. We've reworked the full scheduler underneath there to take advantage of our graph streaming capabilities and, and running TensorFlow inference first and then full support uh, following that. Also, CAFE and Torch uh, are supported in terms of analyzing the networks, uh, extracting the networks and, and the state space and so forth. Um, OpenVX uh, provides a couple of key pieces for us. Um, we, let me be clear, we're not uh, fully conformant uh, yet with the Kronos group, and that will happen shortly after Silicon returns. Um, we're well into that under uh, pre-Silicon conditions. The uh, um, programming model, OpenVX brings a couple of advantages. One of those is it has a very robust industry-supported uh, mechanism for describing task graphs nodes and buffers and graphs and so forth. And, and bringing that to the table in a clear, um, supported fashion is, has a great advantage. However, there are also some challenges for OpenVX from ThinkEye's point of view. And one of those is that, that their mechanisms for customization of the kernels is uh, quite, quite simplistic and um, generally involves punting the work back to the host uh, CPU. And so we've extended OpenVX in, in several and many ways. But uh, one of the more significant ones is we've provided OpenCL C2.1 uh, support for the kernels. So you can program in C, C++ on the kernels. They retain um, all of their acceleration and so forth in the nodes without synchronizing back to the host computer. We also, of course, extended OpenVX to support uh, uh, all of the data types that I mentioned previously, as well as um, some of the built-in instructions and, uh, or functions, rather, that, that we have. With that mechanism, you, uh, we find, frankly, m many parties from autonomous systems to uh, very low, fine-grained uh, uh, custom applications using the ability to really program in C, C++, to be able to use a familiar programming environment and to still achieve exceptional uh, efficiencies. So a couple of anecdotal cases here. Right now on CNN's VGG16 and 8-bit, we're seeing, honestly, 94.8% efficiency through the pipelines. And that comes from simply these mechanisms that I've discussed, but the ability to truly fully populate the pipelines of multipliers, to be able to feed those in a fashion that, that isn't uh, um, uh, burdened through uh, through a fairly simplistic, for example, scheduling mechanism or, or a data delivery mechanism. Physical characteristics, this is, a, I think, base layer, one meta layer, uh, low level, where um, TSMC, 28 nanometer, well, you can read, um, standalone SOC and PCIe accelerator modes. Let me address that briefly. Um, the uh, device, some of our customers, uh, in terms of functional safety and some of the things that uh, we talked about earlier today, are, are very interested in and also even concerned uh, about being able to use MCUs that they are familiar with and that, that are auto called and so forth in their space. And so we find that, that both uh, accelerator mechanisms with uh, PCI interfaces to, uh, to sort of work in a hybridized or heterogeneous fashion is, is very important to them for business reasons as well as engineering reasons. Um, at the same time, some of the edge types of applications that we're, we're very interested in capturing um, are quite interested in the SOC model. Um, some of the details of that will be coming out uh, in the future, but uh, suffice it to say that we use relatively small host core and uh, fairly straightforward mechanisms on that SOC and still are able to attain great throughput because we've made these conscious choices to, uh, to give additional knowledge really to, to uh, our cores in terms of processing at a much higher level with uh, much lower dependency on the host processor. Estimated powers, uh, two and a half watts on the SOC, and uh, we're anxious to see how that goes. So thank you very much. Uh, looks like we have time for some questions. Okay. Go ahead. Um, David Lau from Imagination Technologies. Yes. Um, can you give more detail what you mean by um, uh, your, your device uh, executing graphs natively? I mean, you know, all the graph-based 
uh, frameworks run today on regular computers. What sure, does sure. That mean? Yeah. Um, so let me see if I can give you an analogy. In, in much the way that uh, GPUs today have um, shaders and state associated with them, um, if we collapse that concept into an arbitrary topology with arbitrary buffers and we attach some state to describe nodes in that topology and the connectivity of that topology in terms of structures, file control blocks, buffer control blocks, those kinds of things, if you will. Describing that state to the hardware in the, in the form of a graph inside of a context, the hardware parses um, those state control structures, determines what the graph is inside that scheduler, and, and truly streams. It fractures the work um, and each node of the graph, pulls a small unit of work out, assigns it to a thread, executes that thread down through the network, traces and tracks the dependencies between those units of work, schedules additional work down through the graph in a fully autonom atomic fashion inside the hardware. So there's, there's a task scheduler above, like, instruction level ske scheduling? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Take a question uh, from here. John Creville, Tyrius Research. I'm a little confused at how you would operate this in an SOC mode. It doesn't seem like it'd be uh, run a traditional operating system. It didn't, I didn't see any much in the way of branch predictors and branching uh, operations in what you've described so far. Oh, great maybe question, and, and maybe that was confusing on my part. So in the SOC configuration, um, the ARM core is running an RTOS, and uh, we're using OpenVX. OpenVX runs in this sort of hybrid fashion or heterogeneous fashion where you build a graph, uh, topology nodes, kernels, and so forth, and then you process that graph or schedule that graph. Those semantics... Um, begin execution on our cores. So our cores aren't running the OS. Okay. The ARM cores running the OS. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Yes, please. Hello, um, Mark Minutori from Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, almost all graph algorithms have like irregular access patterns. So I was wondering what's um, in your architecture on the memory side to deal with the irregular access, accesses of the graph algorithms. You know, I agree and disagree. Can I do that up, up here? Um, we're finding increasingly that uh, these very regular access patterns that you see in, in, for example, convolutional neural nets, which is clearly a true statement, um, and, and I'll come back and address your question directly, uh, exist. Clearly they exist, and, and, uh, and no, there's plenty. I'm not talking plenty. about neural networks. I'm talking about like graph pattern matching, like walking on ah. social networks. Okay, example. okay. Yeah. So a couple of key pieces here. Some of them I'll, I'll hold on until we release a little bit more, but let me give you one small piece. Um, we've chosen to be able to provide software control over, for example, the, the cache access patterns and the um, thread execution order and patterns. So we can provide mechanisms at the software level that for certain algorithms, um, maybe a snake pattern through the, through the, the caches is, is more efficient than a traditional row major or something like that. And so, so given various mechanisms to control the advanced scheduler from software, um, we can address some of those in order to capitalize on some of those regular access patterns. Others are more explicit, where um, the, the developer can frankly just choose you know, orders of mechanisms down through the system. Question over here. Oh, yes. Faison from Facebook. Um, you mentioned for graphic, a graph streaming processor, you only uh, need 1% of the, uh, for the intermediate buffers, you only need 1% of the original size. Can uh -huh. you elaborate how you achieve that? Yes. Um, so we, we break the work into, it, let me just do a convolution example from two convolution layers. Um, we support, of course, much deeper than that. But you can imagine um, the, the neighborhood dependencies of a convolution layer from one to the next are quite localized, um, depending on your 
kernel sizes and, and so forth. And, and so we can do that work in, in smaller quantums than, the, than a full feature map. And so we might take an eight by eight block, for example, and, uh, and, and process that eight by eight block at the producer layer, if you will. And then as soon as enough of those eight by eight blocks have completed in the producer level, then we'll start to schedule the consumer level of those. And so you'll see concurrent execution of the producer and the consumers with some latency between those. And uh, in that fashion, sort of breaking the problem down into, into smaller units of work that are, that are owned by individual threads of execution and then having an advanced scheduler that knows precisely when those data dependencies are satisfied and resources are available and so forth. We can so you, on the instruction side, you uh, have the entire um, neural network computation in, in the cache? Could, could you repeat that? I think I didn't follow the question. On the instruction side? OK, so um, you, you have other uh, instructions in your? Order uh, or border? In your, uh, in your uh, of the program in, uh, okay. in the cache. So um, I'm not quite sure I've got context. Okay. I think oh, oh, by the way, um, is your processor a fixed point or floating point? So it's a unified arithmetic uh, pipeline, uh, 8, 16, 32, 64 bit, or uh, 32 bit integer, and then 32 bit float and 64 bit float. Okay, thanks. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, uh, John Maceris, my community. In your results uh, slide, you mentioned that in 28 nanometers, you burn two and a half watts. Yes. Doing VGG 16. 8-bit with 95% pipeline efficiency. Can you tell us what the, this 95% of what peak throughput in your pipeline and also what the area is, please? Um, so part of that we're not releasing yet um, in that question, but I'll be direct as I can. Um, in terms of efficiencies versus direct throughputs, um, our architecture is highly scalable, and it's one of the key pieces that, uh, that, uh, that we we encourage uh, various interested parties to consider in terms of a, an IP negotiation versus a specific chip. Um, our device that, that we're taping out has 16 processors, and uh, the uh, area and peak performance on those will be coming out shortly. The uh, efficiency of that is referring directly to the arithmetic pipelines. So in terms of how often are the integer multipliers engaged performing work uh, against time. Hi. Hi, uh, Peter from NVIDIA. The threads that are executing, is there any grouping to them and are they truly independent from each other that will you end up in any of these deadlock scenarios? If Great. You try to Great question. And that's clearly a difficult part of graph processing. Um, data flow machines from 30 years ago struggled then to prevent deadlock, and, and uh, it's clearly a, a, a complex issue. And the answer is yes, we solved that. Um, we, uh, uh, let me just say this much. We've made some key choices in terms of, of uh, um, mechanisms for, for initiating work down through the graphs. And we've chosen a mechanism where um, threads spawn threads, but they don't spawn them directly. They spawn them back through the scheduler in the sense that uh, those dependencies can be verified and, and uh, resources can be allocated and, and reserved. And so through that fashion, um, we're, able to, we're able to stream both the data and the control. Let me say it that way. And then for the scheduling, do you schedule individual threads or do you group threads together in some fashion? Great question. So you're from NVIDIA, I think. Yes. So let me use the word lanes to mean threads for just a moment. So um, yes, we have a uh, native size of thread, and uh, it's uh, 512 bits. So we'll run 256 uh, lanes, 8-bit data, and it's fully uh, from instruction to instruction. You can uh, operate on any, any of the data width sizes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So I think. We're running uh, towards the end here. We'll do one more question. I think you were standing there. Um, Jack from NVIDIA. Um, I had a question about your streaming uh, tasks. 
uh, graph model. Um, is it um, a bunch of threads creating each other? Is the program model one where threads create and die, thread, create and die, or is it more of a persistent thread model where there's a thread iterating, iterating, producing data, and another thread's consuming it? Great question. So um, it's more of a short-lived thread model from the point of view. Um, we have some customers that are doing something similar to what you're suggesting with the, the more persistent thread. Um, the natural model of the hardware scheduler is to uh, fracture the work into smaller, short-lived threads. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. We'll do it. Thank you.